Thank you, Ben. Now I'd like to introduce our special guests. Doug Stanton, our guest host, earned an MFA at the Iowa Writers Workshop and taught English at Northeastern Louisiana University before starting to write for national magazines, including Outside, Esquire, and Men's Journal. He is now a number one New York Times bestselling author of The Odyssey of Echo Company, In Harm's Way, and Horse Soldiers, which was made into the Jerry Bruckheimer movie, 12 Strong. The audiobook of In Harm's Way is the winner of the 2017 Audi Award in the History category. This year, Doug received the prestigious Stephen E. Ambrose Oral History Award. Right now, Doug is busy working on a movie script, which is based on his first book, In Harm's Way. Doug is the co-founder of the Traverse City Film Festival and the National Writers Series. He used the NWS as a springboard for creating the Front Street Writers Program, which is a free four credit program modeled after the Interlochen Arts Creative Writing Program, which Doug attended as a high school student. Front Street Writers is taught at the Career Tech Center here in Traverse City. And if you want to find out more, go to frontstreetwriters.com. Brad Thor graduated cum laude from the University of Southern California, where he studied creative writing, film, and television production. He went on to create, produce, write, and host the critically acclaimed national public television series, Traveling Light. He is a number one New York Times bestselling author of 20 thrillers, including Backlash and Spymaster. In 2008, Brad shadowed a black ops team of Af in Afghanistan to research his thriller, The Apostle. He also served as a member of the Department of Homeland Security's analytic red cell unit. He has lectured to law enforcement organizations on over the horizon future threats and has been a keynote speaker for the National Tactical Officers Association annual conference. In his new book, Near Dark, which is coming out July 21st, the world's largest bounty has just been placed upon America's top spy. The book has been praised by the Providence Journal as an exquisitely tailored and brilliantly realized action tale, as close to perfect as a thriller can be. With that high praise, I am pleased to welcome our host, Doug Stanton, and guest author, Brad Thor. If you could both unmute yourselves, uh, that'd be great. It was not letting us. Now it is. Thank you. Hey, there we go. Now there we're. Go. Un they've unmuted us, Mr. Thor. Here we are. Well, just in time, Doug, for my neighbor to get the lawnmower and the leaf blower out. So it's, oh, there we go. I love this new era of Zoom. We're gonna have fun though. Well, welcome, Brad Thor, to the National Writer Series. You've been a perennial ask on our guest list, and we're, I'm really thrilled to finally talk to you and talk about the new book, Near Dark. I started, of course, in 2002 with The Lions of Lucerne. Mm. And so I thought maybe we'd get going by just telling us what happens in Near Dark, what's the elevator uh, headline on that, and then uh, where did we leave your hero in your last novel? So Lisa did a great job introducing the book and thank you, Lisa, thank you, Ben, thank you, Doug and Ann and everyone else for having me. This is a, a real honor. Um, if Near Dark was a movie, and by the way, I've done 20 thrillers as Lisa said in her lovely introduction, but I say my books are like the James Bond movies. You don't have to have seen any of them to jump right into the latest one. Uh, so in this one, uh, the log line uh, for the movie poster would be uh, the world's largest bounty has just been put on the head of America's top spy. Uh, Scott Harvath is my recurring protagonist, and he is probably at the lowest point he's ever been professionally, personally. Uh, he's down in Key West, and uh, he's spending most of his time behind a bottle of bourbon, not sure if he wants to go on 
uh, either with his career or his life. And so it's a very dark, very low moment. And uh, that's where the book starts. But the action kicks in almost immediately. It does. And we, 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 we uh, find him in Backlash, the previous novel, having lost dear things. Talk about that just a moment. Catch you. Yeah, so uh, a lot happened in Backlash, and one of the things, and it's in the jacket copy for Near Dark, so I'm not giving away any spoilers. Uh, one of the people that he lost was his, was his new wife, and uh, there are two things that Harvath always wanted in life. He wanted to serve his country, and he wanted to have a family of his own, and it, it made for interesting tension in the novels because he was never home. He kept grabbing for the most dangerous assignments that were out there, and it created tension in his relationships. None of them lasted very long. And he finally found somebody who understood him and was willing to put up with that, his need to keep going downrange, that, that addiction to that lifestyle. And as soon as he put a ring on this woman's finger, she was gone. And so it seems like he's been uh, denied the one thing he wanted most in life. And so he's given up. That's, that's where the book opens up. So, Scott, Horvath, uh, with one T, uh, named after your brother, I learned, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Um, uh, Harvath, I'm sorry, I'm not Horvath. <laughs> and, and shot you the correction, huh? He did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, usually a big hook, but I, anyway, um, he's born in 2002, essentially, and I was really curious, let's just talk a moment about where the thriller genre sits right now in the middle of America, and where it kind of sits in our consciousness. We've had a lot of them at NWS. We, we have a huge readership of, of the thriller genre. But 9-11 had just happened. And I see that you published this book, Lions of Lucerne, your first one in 2002. Just talk to us about how you chose um, Harvath. Yeah, so it's a great question. So uh, we actually had this stop the presses moment where we were, all the copy edits were done, the book was ready to go, it was slated to come out January, right, so beginning of 2002, 9-11 happens, and in the Lions of Lucerne, there had been a discussion uh, between characters about some of the biggest terrorist events that had happened. Well, we couldn't have a book come out post 9-11 and not mention 9-11. So we were lucky enough to be able to postpone the book, get it back from the printer and put that in there, those references in there. And I think mine is probably the first thriller to come out post 9-11 to mention 9-11. Um, the idea for Harvath and this kind of genre uh, or, or, or this, this piece of the thriller genre, this idea of one man kind of going and doing the things that need to be done, I, I think is something that we, uh, as citizens in a civilized society, we respect the rule of law, we respect people who are guided by a moral compass and things like this, but I think inherently we all understand that some of the worst actors out there are not signers of the Geneva and Hague Conventions. They're not going to show up on the battlefield with uh, so much as an armband to designate themselves as combatants. They hide behind women and children. They ambush uh, our soldiers and things like this. So I think we all want to believe that there's guys like Scott Harvath out there willing to bend and break some of the rules in order to protect the rest of us. Uh, I'm fond of saying, Doug, that there can be no American dream without those willing to fight and defend it. You can't be an author. I can't be an author. We can't enjoy the comfort and safety of our own homes and things like this without these brave men and women who carry out some of this nation's most dangerous business. So that's a constant theme I have going in, in my thrillers, which is, is that okay? Is it okay for us to not... Uh, abide by our own sets of rules all the time. When is it okay to bend or break a rule? There was a reason everybody loved Kiefer Sutherland as Jack Bauer in the 24 series, because you know we saw the ticking clock, you know the digital clock counting down, and we knew something bad was gonna happen, uh, but for Jack Bauer, because he was gonna shortcut if he had to, to get there and worry about the repercussions later. So that's always been an underlying source of tension, Harvath and his superiors and things like this. And that, that question of what does it mean to send someone like him into the field and to allow him, kind of with a wink, we're gonna look the other way because you know he's got a good moral compass. He's not gonna break the rules because he's a sadist. He's gonna break the rules because it's necessary. But he's also gonna provide his superiors with a certain degree of plausible deniability. So they can't say we sent him out there to break the rules. 
So he's going to end up taking the fall, but he's willing to do that because he thinks that's what's necessary. Yeah. So it's interesting, Brad. In 1992, uh, you you graduate from USC uh, with a and I and you you studied with someone that I met at Iowa, uh, T.C. Boyle. I was going to ask if you had met Tom at Iowa. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine a more different person than Tom Boyle and Scott. Ho uh, Harvath, but it, it's interesting. I want to talk a moment about just your metamorphosis. Um, you grew up in Chicago. Your father had wanted you to be a business major at USC. You actually enrolled in that class. And I found it fascinating that apparently during an econ lecture, you stood up and left. I to did. talk about that moment, because I think we want to talk about your own evolution. Yeah, so it was an econ class, a lovely professor. He came in practically shaking. He was so excited. It was, Valentine's Day was coming up and he said, I got a great project. You are a manager of eight flower stores and you have X amount of roses ordered for Valentine's Day, but only so many vases and everybody wants vases. And the guy was practically trembling. He thought this was such a great project for us. And I just closed the books and I'm like, I'm out of here. And my friend said, where are you going? sitting next to me in the row in the auditorium. And I said, listen, I'd rather take a bullet between the eyes than be a middle manager in a flower store chain for the rest of my life. And they said, Brad, it's just an exercise. You don't have to go into the flower business. I said, this is deeper than the flower business. I just, I'm not happy as a business major. And I ended up sulking for a couple of days. And one of my roommates, I wasn't going to class. And one of my roommates said, listen, go to the college counseling office. This is what they exist for. They're going to help you. And I went in and they administered something. The name has changed now, but back then it was called the Strong Campbell Personality Test. And what they do is they compare your likes and interests with people who are satisfied and fulfilled in different careers. It could be baker, bakers, morticians, whatever it is. And I scored off the charts for writing and publishing. Didn't necessarily mean I'd be any good at it, but it meant that that was an area where I could probably find fulfillment. So I went to the, uh, the registrar's office and said, can I switch my major without declaring a change major? Because I didn't want my dad seeing that I had changed my major from business to creative writing. And they said, yeah. They said, but you have to be very careful because you need to make sure you've got all of your credits done by the time you want to graduate. And they said 24 hours before you can switch your major and go back. So anyway, at the end of the day, my dad's not stupid. He was getting the report cards and saw that there were no more econ or finance classes and he could tell something was up and I eventually had to come clean. But at this point, he, a lot was happening in Hollywood. A lot of the bond traders were leaving New York and going to Hollywood to do uh, film financing and everything. So my dad was reading about it in mainstream business magazines and thought, oh, my son's ahead of the curve. He's going to learn the film business, and then he'll get a graduate degree in the entrepreneurship program at USC. So I, I was like, sure, that's what I'll do. I just got through uh, undergrad, and then that, that was it. I never looked back. Right. And your dad was a Marine, correct? Yeah, he was. Uh, the Marine Corps got him out of the south side of Chicago, and he uh, went to college on the GI Bill. And it seems that he has been a presence in your life, because after you uh, declared this new major, you went to, you graduated and went to Paris in 95 and tried to write a novel. Right, which had never been done, by the way. I don't know if you know this. No American has ever gone to Paris yeah. to write a novel. Uh, <laughs> so I thought that was a pretty cool thing to do. And I got three chapters into it and I felt, oh, this is, I told myself, this is the most solitary profession in the world. I'm not interested in this. I shipped my laptop back home. I took all the money I had saved working in college and I traveled around Europe. Well, it wasn't that it was solitary. It was that I had this voice in the back of my head that I think a lot of us do that said, you know what? You may fail at this. What if you write a bad book? What if you don't get the book published? What if nobody likes it? probably better not to even risk the embarrassment. Go travel, go have a good time, don't do this. And I traveled and I, I, and I got this idea for a TV show. Uh, I wanted to do a travel show for 18 to 34 year olds uh, to encourage younger people to travel outside the US. Don't wait till you're retired, go now. I thought travel made me a better American. I thought it made me more appreciative of how lucky I am to live in this country by seeing it from abroad. Um, so I pitched public television, it worked out, I uh, got my show on the air, did 23 episodes over a couple of seasons, and I got married. And on my honeymoon, my wife asked me, what would you regret on your deathbed never having done? And I blurted out, I didn't even know I said, 
writing a novel and getting it published. And she said, okay, when we get home, you need to start spending two hours protected time every day and make that dream come true. And that's how I wrote my first book. That, I mean, that is a, uh, that sounds like a great marriage and a great story, but I want to back up a minute. You're, <laughs> you're an English major and you decide to pitch a PBS travel show. How in the world, uh, how did that come up? Well, so the way I accomplished it, so I did study, so I was an English major, I'd studied film and television production at SC, and I had this idea, I thought it was a really good idea, because basically the only person on TV at this time uh, was Rick Steves doing his budget travel series, and then a wonderful guy who I just love named Burt Wolf, who did a cooking show. He's just the nicest guy, so funny, uh, so smart. And uh, so I was talking to my dad about this and I said, I, I got, I think I can get this off the ground. It's just, I don't have any experience to lean on other than I did some production assistant work for John Hughes, the filmmaker. And my dad said, listen, nobody's born with a beard. You have to hire a beard. Uh, meaning you have to hire people with more experience and Hollywood's full of freelancers. So what you need to do is find people that would be perfect for this project. And when public television says, what have you done? You shift the attention to, well, let me tell you about my director. Look at how many Emmys this guy's got. So it was, it was a good plan and it worked in public television. Uh, what I ended up having to do is team up with a public television station. I actually funded the pilot on my own. Credit card applications were raining from the sky back then at 21 and a half percent interest. So I put the entire pilot on my own credit cards. And uh, I did a pilot and we showed that to all the public television stations. They loved it. They signed up or they didn't sign up. They said, if the rest of the shows look like this, we would be pleased to put this on our air. And I just went from station to station to station getting commitments. And then I went out and found uh, underwriters for the show and then went and went and did it. Wow. And all those places you visited, I imagine, have somehow turned up in your novels. I mean, I know they have. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to go back then to some of the, I think we're going to see some slides in a little bit, but how did you begin to research and know who to ask, say, when you started out with the Harvath series? Um, you know, because I say that because you've just come from the PBS world and it's not, I, you know, I, I, we both know now how to pick up the phone and who to call, but right. at first it's a mystery. How to talk about that? Because I think readers are curious. Right. So I I had a dear friend of my dad's who's like an uncle slash godfather who was a, a high ranking uh, person in the FBI. He had, he had retired recently from the FBI. He was a special agent in charge in New Jersey before he, uh, before he retired. Uh, he was a source. Uh, one of my neighbors when I was in college was recently out of the army and did a, was part of a very interesting intelligence group. The U.S. Army had gone through the Ranger battalions during the Cold War looking for Rangers who had grown up in households where German was spoken. And they gathered these guys up, taught them a ton of trade craft, and then dropped them in Berlin. Oh, and what they, this what is they, Detachment A, right? Yeah. So what they were there for was if the Soviets ever overran the wall, they were there to conduct guerrilla warfare and slow them down. Oh. So they had weapons caches hidden in parks around Berlin with Krugerrands, radio sets plastered up behind walls in the basements of beer stubes in Berlin. So this buddy helped network with me with some other people. And then the other person, and I don't know if you came across him during the filming of, uh, of 12 Strong, there is one of the original plank owners of SEAL Team 6 named Harry Humphreys, who yeah. is a technical advisor on all Bruckheimer's movies. So Pirates of the Caribbean and all this kind of stuff. And uh, a family friend introduced me to Harry, and Harry could not have been more generous with his time. There was another FBI agent uh, who was terrific. So it, from this small pool of people, I networked through them and worked my way out. And over, boy, about 20 years, I have built a really good network of active and retired people in the military, law enforcement, and the intelligence communities. What is it you like about that world? I mean, uh, uh, it, I mean, you, it, first of all, you sound like you've approached it like a reporter. Like, yeah, to a certain you know, degree. You sources of, and developing sources, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, and you're, you know you're, wait, you're a sunny, happy guy, and so, Harvath is, he can get pretty, he, can, he, he drops into the bottle in, uh, in near dark. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty dark for Harvath. Uh, what's interesting is my dad is the proudest Marine you will ever meet. 
my, uh, my dad celebrates, we, we celebrate Marine Corps birthday every year. And my dad is just, he taught us the Marine Corps hymn when we were kids and all from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. I mean, we could sing it as kids. So we were, we were raised with this deep respect for the military. And then we've got my uncle slash godfathers, the FBI. But what's interesting is the, the Marine Corps in his military service was his ticket out of the south side of Chicago. My grandfather was the first one born in the United States. So my dad's second generation, I'm third. And the dream of the Swedes was to elevate the family each generation so that mm -hmm. each successive generation, it's the American dream, not just for the Swedes, but for everybody. Your kids go further than you did. And so my dad said, listen, I went through the military and I am going to use what I learned and the leg up that they gave me to push you and your brother even further out on the, you know, push the starting blocks of life even further down uh, the, the track for you guys. He said, I want you to get out of college, take over my business, immediately go into the private sector. He said, we, he said, we have so much respect for the police and for the military. I don't want you guys going and pursuing those careers. I want you immediately going into the private sector. That's how we move the Thor family forward. Well, it's funny because all my friends end up being cops and military people. So the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. My dad loved his time in the Marine Corps. Um, I always joke around, I've got a friend who's an author who was a Navy SEAL. And I said, okay, you got it right. You did it in the right order. You were a Navy SEAL and you're an author. I'm an author who wants to be a Navy SEAL. It's never gonna happen, not at my age. So, um, so I, I also believe Stephen King in his book on writing had a great piece of advice, which is you should write what you love to read because that's where your passion is. You know, nobody decides I'm going to pick this genre to write in because I think I can make a lot of money there. And I take what Stephen King says and I extend it. Not only should you write what you love to read because that's where your passion is, but you have a PhD in that particular genre. You've been reading for years. You know why certain books did well and resonated with you and why other ones didn't. You've got a feeling for pace and tempo and the subjects they talk about and all this kind of stuff. So I've always, I used to, my parents were big readers, Doug, and I would grab their Ludlum books or their Le Carre books or their Clancy books the minute they set them down. The book couldn't even get cold on the coffee table before I'd snatch it up and start reading. So that's what I grew up reading and loving. And it was, it just felt natural for me to, mm -hmm. to choose this genre to write it. Well, and it happens to coincide really with the biggest story post 1950 in America, which is, you know, say 9-11 and the constant combat we've been in. Yeah. Um, coming on 20 years. Um, um, what does the, th what can you say in the thriller that you can't say in a quote literary novel or you can't say in a, rom a romance novel? Why, why, how does it speak to us today? Well, it's interesting because the critics tend to pay all the attention to the literary fiction. So commercial fiction, kind of what some of them call beach reads and stuff like that, they look down their noses at. I think for me, the appeal uh, of what I write is that I give you an insider look into the worlds of people who technically don't exist. So our spies and our special operations people are our quiet professionals. They're not allowed to come out and beat their chests and say, look at me and look what I've done. So uh, it's, I'm in the entertainment business. First and foremost, I'm a fiction writer. I want to give you the best escape possible, a white knuckle thrill ride. I want you turning those pages late into the night. Uh, coming back to Stephen King, I would never say that what Stephen King writes is easy. I would never assume to know. I've never walked even you know, across a front porch in Maine in his moccasins. So I, I can't say that what he does is easy. I do wonder sometimes what it's like for him to write what he does because he makes up a certain amount of the rules as he goes. I can't. I have to, I actually have to use the tactics that special operators use. I have to use the trade craft that people at the CIA use. I have to respect the, the diplomatic efforts and the way government works on a global basis and all that kind of stuff. How you get in and out of the White House and what the situation room is like and all that kind of stuff. So I feel there's a lot of rules, a lot of guardrails on what I do. But I've gotten to know that stuff very well over two decades, and I weave it into my stories, uh, and I love to give people that great ride, and the icing on the cake for me is if when they've closed the book, they've actually learned something, maybe have some questions. Uh, you talk about the fact that we've been at war for 20 years. That's really impacting what I'm writing now, because one of, 
I'm a voracious consumer of news. I look over the horizon, what's coming next. One of my biggest concerns as a citizen is that we have a war weary public in the United States. And what would happen if the Russians, if they took Crimea and that got Russia kicked out of the G8, it's now the G7 because Putin annexed Crimea. What would happen if the Russians went after a small member of NATO? For those of you to, who don't know, there is an Article 5 in the NATO treaty that says an attack on one is an attack on all. And that Article 5 has only been exercised one time in NATO's history. We did it. The United States, after 9-11, we said we've been attacked. We want all our NATO allies to come with us and to go to war in Afghanistan. So the backdrop for my thrillers now is, is that what would happen, would, American, would the American public want to send their sons and daughters to Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, places that they maybe never have heard of, much less could find on a map? So if that was the case, if you had a president who didn't want to get dragged into a war in Europe, what kind of things might he allow an operative like mine, Scott Harvath, to do to prevent something like that from happening? So it's a part of kind of the geopolitical landscape that a lot of thriller writers are not looking at that for me is fun because it is so real and so possible. So I, I guess that's what I'm doing that's different from romance or from literary fiction is that I'm looking at real world events or potential real world events and trying to fictionalize them. So problem solving. So if we don't, if we can't send 50,000 troops over a border, you can send 12 people like Scott Harvath. Right? Yeah, and so, you, you do the research and I've learned fascinating things. Like it'd be nearly impossible for us to move tanks and things like that out of Poland or Germany into the Baltics because the railroad gauge changes when you get up there. You actually have to move the tanks and put them on different train, uh, flatbed trains, and those are sabotage points for Russian special forces. So there's all this neat stuff that people love to read my books and then go, oh, that can't be true. Thor made that up, I'm gonna Google that. And they're like, oh my gosh, it is true. So you do have this fun, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not writing instruction manuals, I'm writing thrillers, page turners, but that is part of the fun is when I hear from people going, I can't believe the stuff that you put in there. I thought for sure you made it up and it's true. So I love putting all those little Easter eggs in, in the thrillers. And you call that faction. You take that Correct. Where you, you don't know where the facts end and the fiction begins. Exactly. Um, what, uh, what I know, you know, we're, maybe we should pause for a moment because we're in the middle of another national moment, this pandemic. And I know mm -hmm. that you're at your home and you've had some interesting things to say to your children, uh, probably to your friends about that. Can you talk about that for a moment, how this might be an inflection point? Yeah, I, so I did about six thrillers ago, I did a thriller called Code of Conduct, which is all about a pandemic. And the first page, it opens up, the first sentence said, if the president of the United States could get the virus, that meant no one was safe. And that was the opening, and I did that six books ago. Um, I look at this, so I've been selfish. I have two high school teenagers and I'm, I'm looking at this through the inspiration I've gotten from all the time I've spent with leaders, military leaders in uh, studying leadership, learning from my dad, the Marine, what it means to be a good leader. So I, I've now realized that I was soaking up all of these cues, all of these lessons on leadership. And now I am, be, I am finding myself in a tough situation with the lockdown, particularly with two teenagers and having to be a leader myself, very small unit. It's a four person family. Uh, and my wife leads in her own way, but I'm now incorporating some of these things uh, that I've learned from contacts in the military about leadership. So I'm learning how important routine is and discipline is, discipline in meeting the routine, not meeting out, not meeting out the discipline or meeting out uh, discipline, but meeting a routine and, you know, get up and make your bed every morning and, and having things to look forward to and celebrating small successes and things like this. And I'm, I, and I'm, a greedy because I've got my two high schoolers here. They're gonna be going to college soon. So I'm loving having them at home and I'm trying to find good personal moments to be joyful and grateful myself. So they now see me coming and they run because I try to hug them every time I see them in the kitchen. They're like, uh-oh, here comes Leo Bascaglia again. We gotta run. And so I'm looking at this as an opportunity to tell my kids, you're living through history. Every, your kids, your grandchildren are going to ask you what this was like right now and what you did. And God bless them. They've been fantastic. 
so it is a, you have a choice. I was reading, um, uh, and I always mispronounce the author's last name, Talib or Talib. He wrote Black Swan, Skin in the Game, uh, but he has a book called Anti-Fragile. And he said, in no language in the history of the world do we have a word that's opposite of fragile. If you mail somebody a glass chihuly uh, candy dish, you're gonna stamp red fragile all over it so that they treat the package carefully. There is no word that's the opposite, which means beat the hell out of this package because the contents are gonna get stronger. And so Talib in Anti-Fragile talks about moments of black swan events in moments of uncertainty where a lot of people will kind of lock up and freeze, right? Mike Tyson has that great line that says, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? And in the military, we always hear that, you know, the, the battle plans are always good up until the moment of first contact. And then you have to adapt and overcome. So I'm trying to teach my kids to be resilient and also to help them discover those reservoirs of grit, as Angela Duckworth talked about in her book when she did that whole research project on why cadets wash out in the beginning at West Point and mm -hmm. what determines grit. So I'm trying to help my children find those great things inside themselves. Uh, and by doing so, I learn about me too. So it's been a very positive experience. There's a lot of stuff that stinks obviously about this. I hate seeing people out of work and friends with businesses closing down, but uh, the, the glasses half always uh, half full with me, except I do have a favorite joke I've been making, Doug, during this whole thing. Do you know what the difference is between an optimist and a pessimist during the time of COVID? <laughs> a, no. pessimist says, a pessimist says it can't get any worse and an optimist says, oh yes, it can. <laughs> so we try to keep laughing. So what do you do for fun when you're not working? And let's talk a moment about your work life. But first, I mean, what, uh, what other interests do you have? I don't think people really know that. So I love to read. So we've been reading. We've got so many books where there's a Japanese word for people who buy books that they're never going to read. They just keep buying books and buying books and buying books. And I forget the word. I have to Google it every single time I want to use it. Um, but luckily, we've got shelves and shelves full of books. And we found that even though we're a big reading family, our consumption of books has gone up. We now play board games more often than ever before as a family. Uh, so that kind of stuff, the stuff that is actually good for the soul, good for the family, this not always being silent in front of our phones or in front of TV, we've actually found that that's been very good. This, we've been given a gift of time. It's the one thing we never have in our modern rush, rush, rush kind of life. And this is a gift. You can look, it's a blessing or a curse depending on how you look at everything. And so we mm -hmm. choose to find the good in everything because that's what grit is. That's what anti-fragile is. Um, someone from the NWS team just said, tweeted, the, the word is sunduko to sunduko. That's, yep, thank you. That's I'm, it. I'm not saying exactly right. Interesting. Um, uh, do you travel much? You know, I, are you? Are Used you, to. Okay, I got that. Um, Used to, yeah. I mean, I was in a several places in Key West doing research. In fact, you know what? If I could have Ben pull up photo number five, I just, we've okay. talked about my dad, we've talked about my research and stuff. Uh, photo number five, this is a picture of me and my dad in Oslo, Norway, on the roof of the Thief Hotel, uh, end of August last year. The Oslo and Norway play a big role in the book, and actually the Thief Hotel does. So uh, we were there having a drink and doing some research and stuff. So that's a, that's a nice picture of my dad, the Marine, and me. Um, and, uh, the, the other one, Ben, if you could pull up maybe number three, uh, so photo number three, this is me. I actually took my kids, uh, last summer, uh, a different trip, uh, to Switzerland. Uh, I wanted them to see the Lion of Lucerne. This is what inspired me to write my novel. I wanted them to know, you know, where music lessons and trips to the orthodontist and, uh, you know, their favorite cereals, what, what gave birth to all that. Uh, and maybe also, uh, there's one other one, number four, if you could, Ben, it's just another picture from that trip. Uh, this is me on one of the covered bridges in Lucerne where uh, some pretty big action in line of, lines of Lucerne happened. So thank you for those, Ben, I appreciate it. So yeah, this, is, this was neat. I mean, I was in Germany, I was in Switzerland, I was in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. 
uh, last summer as well as Key West. So uh, yeah, I'm a big traveler. It's in it, it's it's what I love to do, and it's the one thing I cannot wait to get back to once this is all over. Right. So I know you're not an outliner, right? You're more of a what, what they call organic. A, yeah, you're okay. Or seat of the pants, you might say. Is yeah. what I got. Um, I was surprised to read to hear that because. You know, they're, they're not uh, see the pants and, you know, in the, in, the, in the military, but that doesn't mean you have to write like that. But no. You know, it, it, and so it's more chaotic. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, there was and I forget the author who said this, that said writing books is about seat of pants to seat of chair. Uh, and Jack London also famously said, you cannot wait for inspiration. You have to go after it with a club. And that is especially true for me because I'm expected to deliver a manuscript a year. So it really comes down to self-discipline. Um, many years ago, my agent uh, suggested that I consider outlining. And Dan Brown and I are friends. And uh, Dan uh, also is with my same literary agent. And uh, so she said, maybe Dan will let you see the outline for Da Vinci Code. It's pretty cool. And I got to see the outline for Da Vinci Code. I got to, it was really neat, all the detail. And I got to see the coolest part for me was what Dan left out of Da Vinci Code, the scenes that didn't make the final cut, you know, coming on, uh, gathering them up off the cutting room floor. And so I thought, okay, I'll try to outline a novel. And I did, I outlined one and I went to write it and I couldn't do it. All the surprise was gone. There's a quote from Robert Frost that says, no joy in the writer, no joy in the reader, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. I wanna have the experience writing my novels that readers are gonna have reading them. I want my palms to sweat. I want my heart to pound. Uh, I want to not know what's going to happen next. And a lot of times I paint myself into a corner and I wind up, it's the end of the day and I haven't figured out how to get out of the corner. And I go home and I joke that my wife knows if it's going to be a red wine night or a bourbon night by the look on my face. And she always says, listen, don't worry. You always figure it out. Get a good night's sleep. Go up to the, to the office in the morning. You'll figure it out. And that's always true. Uh, sometimes I think it might be easier if I was an outliner, but it would take the fun out of it for me. And that's what I'm in this job for. If it, if, if it wasn't challenging, it wouldn't be exciting. It, it'd be boring. And I wouldn't be able to do it if it was boring. It's hard. It's really hard, particularly because I try to raise the bar every single book every year. I try to get better as a writer. I spend a lot of time in the off season reading books about writing because I think a writer is someone who can constantly get better. And so I'm constantly trying to get better because I feel I owe it to my bosses, the readers. What, um, what's the last book you read whose writing really turned you on? You know, uh, who's, I, well, it, the, the, All the Light We Cannot See is some of the best writing uh, I've ever read. I mean, that book was so beautiful that I actually purposely slowed myself down. I slowed myself down. I normally don't read fiction. I particularly don't read fiction in my genre when I'm writing. I read that because I said, if I could come anywhere near to the beauty of that writing, I really challenged myself to elevate my game. And I would just like, pour, I was like a guy in a lifeboat that only had a couple rations left. I'm just nibbling off a little bit of all the light we cannot see each day. It was just, it's such a beautiful book. May I, I also recommend Kate Atkinson and her book, um, Life After Life, if you've not read it, it's amazing. I have it. It's, this, it's in that same, uh, you, you'll feel the same way about it. Yeah, she's a fantastic writer. Um, we're gonna go to questions in just a little bit, but um, okay. I know that uh, um, people are, well, I'll read, I'll read one right now. Um, you, you ran for president in 2018, we withdrew. Well, I declared yeah, you, that I wanted to primary yeah. Donald Trump. Yes. What was that about? I mean, is, was that a... So I grew up, like I said, son of a Marine. My mom was a flight attendant for TWA in the glamour days, the 1960s. They both were entrepreneurs. And we were raised in our house that we don't own this country, that we are merely stewards. And it is incumbent upon us to make sure that a freer, more prosperous, more equitable, more secure nation gets handed to the next generation then gets handed to us. I've worked on presidential campaigns and I had just kind of hit the wall. I had been very, very upset with the way things were going. I had been promised forever by the Republican Party that if they got control of everything, they would bring spending down. And I actually see the national debt as a national security issue. 
And national security is kind of my baseball. It's what I write about. It's what I'm passionate about. And I just, I hit a wall. I said, you know, I've been lied to about what was going to happen if they could get control of Congress and then get a Republican in the White House. And I was just super frustrated. And I said, okay, that's it. I'm going to go. I'm going to get this guy on the debate stage. And I'm going to really, I know a lot about politics. I know a lot about the Constitution, the founding documents, and what this nation stands for. And I'm going to rip them apart on a debate stage because I don't have any political capital to lose. And then the further the stuff went on, I said, you know what? I don't even want to be a Republican anymore. I'm so disappointed that the things that these guys yelled about for eight years under the Obama administration now is okay because their guy is in office. And I thought, you know what? I don't want any part of this. And I'm out. And I also came to a realization, which is for years, it bothered me that actors were involved in politics. You know, you hear the shut up and sing sort of a thing. And I had this moment of clarity, which was, I'm doing the same thing. What a hypocrite I am to complain about celebrities getting involved in politics. And I've done the same thing. Regardless of what my parents told me was my responsibility as a citizen, I was turning off some of my readers. And that's not good. I don't want to. And I realized I'm going to get pink slipped because, like I said, I work for the readers, not for the publisher. So I realized that, the, the, that discretion was the better part of valor, that you know, people wanted me to use what I have to entertain them with my books, not to get into political debates and all that kind of stuff. So I just kind of folded up my tent, and that was the, that was the end of that. I was just like, I washed my hands of the whole thing. I'm out. Plus, Twitter is a nightmare. I, the day I got off Twitter... Uh, I saw the best tweet ever that said, Twitter is like giving the dumbest person you know a bullhorn. And it is so perfect, a description of Twitter. I said, that's great. What a perfect thing to read on my way out. Yeah, well, I mean, you can take, channel whatever energy and thinking you're having, and that becomes part of the Harvath, you know, world. Yeah, the, those, the, 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 the fight between those ideas, you know. The, your books aren't political, but they're certainly uh political arguments made in them they kind of rise out of the action um yeah, sure. and that's part of doing espionage and special operations there is a political component in there there are fights that happen in dc over should we be sending troops to this right. area or what happens you know you're going to get an angry ambassador if he doesn't know this operation is happening in his backyard or her backyard so that that makes that inner office stuff is very interesting i think everybody can relate to it i know we have a slide of you and mandy patankin and i um Ah, uh, slide number one, please, Ben. Yeah. Speaking of, you know, a show that deals with <laughs> should we? One of my favorites. Yeah, go ahead. This has got a this has got a great story behind it. So uh, I'm a big fan of Homeland, and uh, I was out to dinner in New York with my agent and her husband, and we were the last people in uh, in the restaurant except the table behind us, which turned out to be uh, General Michael Hayden, the former director of the CIA, and Mandy Patinkin. Uh, from Homeland, and uh, nobody else was in the restaurant, and so I, they were finishing with their dinner, they were on coffees, and so I walked over, and I said, I'm so sorry to interrupt, uh, I'm a huge fan, and uh, would you mind if I got a picture, and Mandy gets up and says, of course not, and I hand him my camera, and he looks at me, and I said, I want my picture with the real CIA director, and I walked over and got a great picture with just, we took this one after, it was just one of me and Mike, uh, General Hayden, so it was kind of funny, and Mandy's got a great sense of humor. So I think that's probably the first time General Hayden was ever out with Mandy Patinkin and somebody said, General Hayden, yeah, I'd like, thank you, Ben, you've got that one. I forgot to put it on my list. But yeah, so I think it was probably a lot of fun for, for General Hayden to have somebody come up and say, no, I don't want a picture with Mandy. I want one with you. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's, uh, that, that, that show really does twist on the idea of what, what is the good, you know, what is right. the good and uh, that's what I think really drives the popularity of the thriller novel and what, and that's where Harvath lives. Um, we've had, by the way, Chip uh, Johannesson was uh, really uh, one of the chief writers. He came to the writer series a couple of years ago. I'll have to send you that. Oh, wow. And it, be, and it became a, a, a friend, an interesting show. I was actually uh, able to be on the set for the filming of one of the last episodes because I have a, always had a huge crush on Claire Danes. I mean, I don't know if oh. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it, there are some neat, that, that is one of the, and I'm going to ask Ben for another slide. Uh, 
Ben, if you could bring up uh, slide number two, please. One of the neat things about being an author and writing in this genre, this is me. I got to fly with the Blue Angels a couple of years ago. Um, and so it, you get to do these really, really cool things. And in addition to flying with the Blue Angels, uh, Ben, if you could bring up slide number seven, please. I also got to go to Afghanistan. Uh, this is me in Jalalabad. Uh, in, in Shadow of Black Ops team that was over there gathering intelligence. I got to see how they built their human networks and all this kind of stuff. So writing has opened a lot of doors for me to do some really, really cool things. When people ask me, I look at this photo in Afghanistan, when people ask me, you know, tell, tell me about Scott Harvath. I said, well, he's my alter ego, the same way I'm sure Bond was for Ian Fleming and Jack Ryan was for Clancy. And then I say, he gets to do the things that my wife won't let me do. And if she's within earshot, she says, well, I did let you go to Afghanistan. So she always gives me that one, you know, but she draws the line at me going to embassy cocktail parties and seducing intelligence operatives like Claire Danes or, you know, Russian female spies or what have you. <laughs> Smart woman. There you go. Yeah, there's a bright line. <laughs> um, I see a question here from one of, one of your biggest fans, uh, our dear friend Rochelle Riley. Oh, hi, Rochelle. Yeah, she's watching so right wonderful. now. Um, she writes, I have to ask how you're able to write so quickly, and it may not feel quick to you, and so effectively about the life-threatening escapades of this hero, and, oh, who will play him in the movie? There's always that question. So go ahead. Sure. Take it away. sure. Well, the reason I'm able to do a book a year is that uh, my wife and children actually suffer from a terrible, terrible addiction, Rochelle. They like to eat. Um, they enjoy heat in the winter time, uh, so I have to I have to write or I don't get paid. Uh, you know, it's a, it's an incredible motivator to have a uh, the uh, the deadline hanging over you <laughs> each year, and you have to perform. Um, and I don't want to disappoint my fans. I people people actually plan their vacations around the release of of my thrillers. They, they say, oh, it's going to be out just in time. I'm going to, I'm going to plan that week to go to the beach or go to the lake, whatever it is. Um, so that, because I have a deadline and I think, I think Rochelle, you probably would agree having been a, a, a journalist for so many years. I mean, Rochelle's been under deadlines as well for getting columns in and things like that. Um, as far as who's going to play Harvath in the movie, we've been having a big discussion about that right now in Hollywood. And what I love is that the director and the producer, we all agreed. We had this discussion, should the movie make the star or should the star make the movie? And we all agreed, no. We like that Connery approach, the Sean Connery approach, where it's a relative unknown. So that when you saw Sean Connery, he's James Bond. When you see our Scott Harvath, you're gonna say, that's Scott Harvath. You're not gonna go, wait a second, wasn't that guy in that movie five years ago who was the goofy boyfriend to the girl with the six cats? We, we didn't want something like that. So it's gonna be a Sean Connery, like our version, like the American version of Sean Connery. Gonna be a fabulous actor, perfect for the role, who nobody really knows very well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in discussion, but under wraps in a way. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Um, when I talked to Lee Child at the National Writer Series, he um, he made he made the startling re revelation. Uh, what a student act, act, asked him actually, "Do you revise?" And he said, "I don't." And uh, it was kind of a startling answer for him. And uh, I wondered what your you know talking about your your process. You know, you have to do a book of years, Rochelle. So do you revive? How do you? I mean, how do you? Do you put it up on the wall? Just talk about what it looks like to be in your office. Yeah, so I do put a lot up on the wall just as I go, things that I don't want to forget. So I'll have post-it notes or three by five cards. I do pictures of actors so I can keep the character straight. I assign an actor to each character in the story. Uh, I, along those lines, I got asked recently. How much fat, how much do you trim? How much do you cut out next to nothing? The only thing that gets cut out is my wife will read the first version of the manuscript. And if she sees I've repeated myself, that gets cut out. Other than that, it is very muscular, very lean. Each chapter serves a purpose, short, cinematic, crisp. It serves a purpose to give a certain piece of information to move on to the next chapter. So um, I won't say I don't revise because you know we'll do three, four, five, passes editing but it isn't necessarily to to do revisions it's to catch typos and things like that 
I could, I could sit with a manuscript for 10 years and rewrite sentences. And it wouldn't necessarily be because the sentences need to be better. It's just because every time I think, oh, well, I could say it this way. You can really get in this, in this do loop. And I think to be an efficient once a year thriller author who's going to land high on the bestseller list and keep the fans happy, you really have to have an economy of, uh, I, I don't know if economy of words is the right thing, but you really don't have the luxury of just splashing paint all around the place and figuring out how you're going to clean it up later. You really have to go through, and it's got to be clean all the way through because you only have X amount of time to work on your manuscript. You're either you know, researching a manuscript, writing a manuscript, edit editing a manuscript, or promoting the finished book. So you're always in one stage of that cycle when you're on a one a year contract. So to do it right, I think you've just got to be lean and mean, uh, which I think focuses the mind and also adds to the quick pace in the tension in the novel. You're not wasting a lot of time talking about, oh, and then he cracked two eggs and then he got the milk and then he, you know, I love Clancy, but the best piece of advice I ever heard Elmore Leonard give young writers is leave out the parts that people skip. Right. The tech stuff with Clancy, for me, was a little much. I don't need to know how a guidance system on a missile works. I want to know there's two guys in the brush with a laser, and they put the laser on the target, and that's what the missile hits. I'm good. I don't need to see the word gyroscope in my manuscript, none of that kind of stuff. It's just different, but that's how I keep people flipping those pages, is I don't give them a chance to catch their breath or stop. Right. Um, you said you love a surprise. Just talk about Near Dark for a moment, and we'll, then we'll take another question. I mean, what was the biggest surprise in writing that novel? I'm assuming you meant kind of an emotional surprise or about Harvest's character. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I struggled with the beginning because that concept of a $100 million bounty on Harvath's head um, was actually, uh, when I was starting last year's book, Barnes and Noble said, hey, can we get a bonus chapter? We'd love to do a special edition of Backlash. And I said, sure, you could, uh, idiot. Of course, I'm all, you know, my eyes are bigger than my stomach at Thanksgiving. I'm sitting down to write a manuscript. Sure, what's a bonus chapter? Well, you ring yourself out to complete the manuscript. You get it all tied up. Every plot line is tied off, snipped. Everything's in a bow. And now I got to come up with a bonus chapter. I'm like, what am I going to do? And I got to think about my kids in the Marvel movies, how we always have to sit through the credits because there's one more scene. Uh, and I thought, okay, how do I do this? And I came up with this idea that there's this uh, European banker type guy with a bunch of bodyguards in this crummy rundown French colonial style mansion in Vietnam's third largest city. And he's there with all this cash putting together a bounty on Scott Harvath. And I wrote this chapter. My editor loved it, said it was the best chapter she'd ever read. And I was so thankful. We sent it to Barnes & Noble. They loved it. Boom. Done. Right? Not done. I realize now that when that was published, it becomes part of my universe, of my work. And I can't do the, the oh gosh, he woke up the next morning and said, whoa, what a bad dream, a hundred million dollar bounty on my head. So that had to be the jumping off point. But I thought, how the heck is one assassin versus 50? How are they going to find my guy? If he throws his phone away, you're never going to find him. So I ended up working with my network of uh, special operations people, and particularly CIA folks, and said, what would happen if somebody put this bounty on you? And they stepped me through how they would do it. I'm like, okay, now I got it. My guy's not the mouse. He's going to flip the script. He's the cat. And those who put up the money, they're the mice. They just don't know it. They think they're cats. They're not cats. And he's going to reverse engineer the thing and get to them before they can get to him. So that was probably the biggest revelation. I started the book not knowing what I was going to do. That was the biggest stumbling block for me. Yeah. Um, when you had those meetings with the agency people, were they in person? Or do you take notes? I mean, how, how are they, how, how do they impart their knowledge? That's a good question. Yeah, it, it, it depends. Uh, I buy a lot of pitchers of beer. I buy a lot of steak dinners. Uh, I like having multiple people, multiple people out at the same time because we get, they get to telling stories, you know, but it, the hardest thing for me to do, Doug, is to sit there and be quiet. I learn more if I keep my mouth shut. 
and keep the beer flowing and all that kind of stuff. And they never tell me anything that's, you know, top secret that I'm not supposed to know and that kind of stuff. You know, there may be a, oh, you weren't supposed to hear that. You didn't hear that Thor kind of a thing, you know. Um, but I prefer to do things in person whenever I can. Uh, obviously, it's a little tough right now with all the restrictions. Uh, but there's no, there's no substitute for a face-to-face. -face. And these people are so good in, uh, they, they're hired to do what they do because they're such good people people. You know, they're really good at interpersonal skills and all that kind of stuff. It's really fun to be around them. And they'll go, here, watch what I do with the bartender. Okay. See, he can't, these people can't get his attention. Watch what I do. So you learn a lot of these quirky things that they do. They're such savants when it comes to human nature and what human beings do and what motivates human beings. It's all, it's, it's like going to a magic show half the time. It really is funny. It's like, okay, if you pay this guy a compliment, he's not going to respect you. But if you pay this one, like watch the difference and they can figure out people's personalities. I, I, could, I could spend months with these people and learn something every hour of every day. They're amazing. Yeah, the reporter in you gets really intrigued, I think. It's interesting. Yeah. Jason Matthews was a guest here, and he, uh, he duped me in the hotel where I went to pick him up by just changing his jacket inside out and was standing right next to me and was laughing because I couldn't find him. And uh -huh. been, Isn't that funny? He'd been stationed in Moscow uh, with the agency. So, yeah, no, it is, it's human. You really, uh, it's about human nature. I give me a lot mm -hmm. of questions about... Why only a Harvath? Uh, are there more characters? What are you working on now? And uh, why just one superhero? Uh, that's the, it keeps coming up in the chat line here. Um, well, it's a, it's a great question. It's after I wrote my first novel, I didn't intend for Harvath to be a series character, but he was so popular that my publisher came to me and said, tell me who you're reading. Who do you read? Who's got a new book out that you can't wait to read? Or who's got one coming out? And I would list you know, these people and, and my publisher's like, yeah, those are all franchise series characters. Is it because you love the author's writing or is it because you, I'm like, I love the character? Well, if that character was going to, if the whole book was going to unfold in Scranton, would you still buy it? I'm like, yeah, I want to. And they said, that's exactly what we're talking about. You've, Brad, you've created this fantastic character that people are going to want to go on adventures with again and again and again. This is really something good. Don't stop. Don't stop. You will regret if you don't bring this character back. And so that's, that's what I did. That's why the characters come back. But now with all of the lockdown stuff, back to my thing about we've been given the gift of time, I do have something that is unrelated to Harvath, the Athena project. I've got something that's completely detached from Harvath's world that has been a passion project of mine, still a thriller, still in that world that I've wanted to do. So it's something I'm trying to run on a parallel track now just to say I did it, just like that first novel. I don't want to go to my deathbed wondering, what if I'd done something completely detached from Harvath? I mean, this thing could go through the roof and I could be with you next year and you could say, boy, aren't you sorry you didn't write that book 15, 20 years ago? And I could say, yeah, but thank God I did it, you know? Um, someone asks, has Harvath ever met his match? I think he's met his match in this book. I think Solvi Kolstad, the Norwegian intelligence service uh, in, intel officer, is his match. That's what I set out to do. And I think when you read Near Dark, I, 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 I'll be interested to hear. I, I converse daily on Facebook with, with readers. And I'm getting, like I said, such great feedback about the Solvi character. Um, I, I think he's met his match in her. I absolutely do. She may be even better than him. Yeah, when she appeared, I thought, aha, here's the companion. Uh, he's got a big hole in his life. And he's going to maybe move forward with this new person in a way. Somebody that's, somebody that's had just as much pain in her past. And yeah, so there's a, there's a kinship there. They're both kind of scarred all over. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of that scene in, uh, in Lethal Weapon with Mel Gibson when he gets together romantically with Rene Russo and they're both getting undressed and they're dropping guns and knives and all that kind of stuff. And then they're looking at each other's scars. There's bullet holes and knife wounds. And, you know, it, it's, it's obvious they were such a good match for each other, not only physically, but experientially. We're almost out of time. Tell us, I'm getting questions too in the chat about what's next. You know, I mean, we've just, you've just said it, but when, when, when should they plan their next vacation? It'll be next summer, about this time. So we haven't picked a publication date, but I'm always out kind of mid to late June, early July is when uh, stuff comes out. So we're catching you right now, um, Brad, just on the promotional part of your life. But when this ends, you are, well, what happens? 
I, it's, it's back to writing full time. In fact, this book, we pushed it off by a month. We actually had an earlier release date in June and we delayed it by a month because we were hoping that I could be out on the road, that we'd get coronavirus under control and I could go out because I love to go on the road. I love to go to events like this, to go to bookstores and things like that. And so we push it off. This is actually a later release for me than normal. So when the, when all of the publicity and the virtual events end, I'm back at my desk, seat of pants, seat of chair, Jack London club going after inspiration on a daily basis in, in writing away on the new, long, uh, the new long, Scott Harbin. How long will it take you to draft the first, you know? I always say, how long is a piece of string? Each <laughs> book is different. It yeah. depends on how much research. Um, you know, I always pick a topic that I'm interested in learning more about that I can weave into the story. That's the rocket fuel that gets me through the year of writing. But each book is different. Some books move faster, some books move slower. So they're, they're, they're like kids. They each have their own individual personalities. Okay, well listen, um, I wanna hold up Near Dark one more time. Uh, it's for sale everywhere. Of course, you published uh, Tuesday, right? Mm -hmm. so I did, thank you. We wanna look for it on the New York Times list very soon, the first week. And uh, if you're locally here and an NWS fan, uh, go to Horizon Books uh, and you can buy uh, Near Dark, uh, Brad's new novel. Um, it's been a real thrill to talk with you. Uh, and Doug, can I just add, I'm sorry, that if they do buy it there, it comes with an exclusive signed book plate that I signed myself. And then you will get hidden inside your book one of four of these really cool five by seven cards that I designed and wrote uh, a piece of information on the back on. I picked four cool spots, plot points in the book and developed them a little bit further. So you'll get one of those cards along with a signed book plate if they order from the supporting bookstore there. Wow, way to go. Yeah, wanted to do something special for the viewers tonight so and for the bookstore. Well, listen, uh, we hope to see you in person someday with the new novel. Sure. And thank you so much for being our guest. Um, and thank you for supporting NWS by being here. It really means a lot. Oh, it's my pleasure. And it's been, a, it's been a great time. And I want to thank all of the viewers tonight. And uh, I look forward to making it up to Traverse City to be able to see you all in person, maybe next year. Uh, wouldn't that be great? It would be. All right. Thank you. Okay.